guys, it's Rodney from I Comply here, and we're here for another episode of Having a Yarn on the Farm, where we talk about all things farming related and issues facing farmers and the broader community. Um, today, I'm going to talk about something very important, and uh, on Are You OK Day, I think it's only appropriate to have a yarn about what I like to call the unspoken word of the farming industry. And uh, it's something that has been bubbling along the surface over the last couple of months and I've actually seen a lot a lot more issues regarding this problem and uh, it's a problem that often gets swept under the rug and something that farmers don't like to talk about but uh, today we're not only going to pull it out from under the rug we're going to have a chat about it with a good friend of mine and a, a man that's gone through his issues over the past and there's a strong advocacy of course I'm talking about mental health and I want to welcome a long time mate of mine, Joey Williams. Joe, um, thanks for having a yarn with us on the farm. Hi brother, it's been a while mate. Uh, yeah. to connect again, all yeah. virtually. I know mate, it's a sign of the times. Um, Joey, for, for the benefit of um, the people that live in Melbourne and Adelaide and Perth and probably don't necessarily follow rugby league, I'm just gonna give everyone a little bit of a snapshot of, of your life and a little bit of background about yourself. Um, you. You're a teenage prodigy, uh, signed by the Sydney Roosters at 13 years of age on a scholarship, and uh, brought down to the Sydney, brought down to Sydney, if memory serves me correct, at 17 or 18, by the late and great Arthur Beetson, who uh, brought you down to Sydney. Um, you debuted for South Sydney Rabbitohs, I think, uh, as an 18-year-old. Um, the weight of expectation of wearing the number seven for Souths is probably. The only thing more than that, I dare say, is being an Indigenous boy wearing the number seven for South in such a proud, uh, a proud Indigenous club. Uh, you come down from Cowra uh, via Wagga, so you're a country kid at heart. Um, you forge what would what would be a successful career in rugby league by some standards, although uh, some might say that um, your ability you probably didn't reach the heights that your ability enabled should have should have, I should say. Um, you then moved across to professional boxing um, and you you also had a very, very good mentor there in the great man, Johnny Lewis, um, and fought for a couple of uh, welterweight titles, won two WBF junior welterweight titles, um, and forged a successful career in boxing. Now, what a lot of people, I guess, didn't realize over that time was you were fighting a mental health battle um, throughout that time, the weight of expectation and um, for someone that, you know, I knew you closely, I, I didn't realise it was as bad as it was, um, but you hit it pretty well and I think it, it come to a head when you attempted to take your own life and now you're, uh, that was probably the best thing could have ever happened to you because you found your calling and you're a strong advocate advocate for mental health and also a accomplished author now. Um, Joey, tell us about your, your sporting career and uh, a little bit of the battle that you faced uh, whilst you know, living in that constant spotlight. Yeah, you know, and, and you hit it on the head and, and we, were, we were talking off air as well about, like we used to live together, hmm. you know, and, and, and you helped me out of stack load when, when I first went through a, a marriage separation and so forth. and. And mate, the closest of people had no idea. You know, my parents had no idea. My 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 siblings had no idea. Um, for what it was, I guess starting at the start, um, you know, it started for me at a very young age. Um, and there's it's well documented now around concussions and head knocks and and, and the different uh, challenges with with the the ongoing impacts of of, of concussions. It started on the back of the first concussion I had, or, or the, the first time I remember it was on the back of a concussion, a significant concussion at a really young age that, you know, when your head gets knocked around and, and the brain's not designed to be smashed around inside the head, you know, with what, yeah. with, with what we do as, as rugby league players and boxers and, and, and many people, you know, the body's not designed for that. And after that first concussion, it started a, a conversation in my head. Um, and it was an extreme amount of doubt. It started to need to get me to second guess every decision I made, 
Uh, it, it brought on extreme paranoia with to think that everyone was talking about me and and really negative and and, and everything I did, it was. I, I had to do over and above because of everything that inside my head told me it wasn't good enough. And that, that although how, how good that I was going or what I was achieving, it wasn't good enough. And then, then that would never amount to anything. And, and, you know, it got to the point where it started to talk to me and, and, and plant the thoughts and ideas to not be here anymore. And, and obviously very delicate with what I say and how I say it, um, knowing that, Many people right across the globe are challenged by this stuff, and particularly in the farming industry, I get it. Um, you know, I, I, I'm conversing with with many farmers uh, all, all year round uh, around the different challenges that they go through mentally and emotionally. Um, but for me, that started that dialogue inside my head that told me I wasn't good enough, that I'd never amount to anything, and started to talk to me. And and people say, do you have like a diagnosed like schizophrenia or, or we've got voices in the head. Well, no, that's not the case. What I have is an inner dialogue like everyone has. It's just that instead of me talking to me when I'm hungry and telling me that I need to have a feed or, or that I'm tired or when I wake up, I need to go to the toilet. Like my head is like a like somebody sitting inside my head, continuously talking to me every single day, every moment of the day planning thoughts, plans, and ideas to not be here anymore. Well, I think, Joey, you, you know, I, I was, we were good mates and we, we hung out quite a lot. And, um, you know, I followed your career in rugby league and you actually had the weight of expectation on you. You know, you were like a lot of indigenous kids and you, you're a proud Aboriginal man. And, uh, you know, you came down from, you know, you've been in Cowra, been in Wagga, all of a sudden you're in the big smoke. Um, the weight of expectation, you play a couple of good games, you, you score a couple of tries and everyone's patting you on the back and telling you how good you are and you're feeling fantastic. And the next week you come out and you get flogged by 40 and everyone's out there bagging you and saying, you know, oh shit, he's no good. Let's flick this poor kid back to the bush. Um, it's not only that, that, Rod, it's- All that head noise. It's, yeah, it's not only that, you know, it's it's what I was fighting as much, as much as things were tough on the field, it's what I was fighting off the field and upstairs in my head off the field. And what I did for so long, even as a young bloke, as, it, as I said, this stuff started when I was, you know, 13, 14 year old. Um, I silenced it with with drinking as much as I could. And then when it got to the point where I was in Sydney in the bright lights, it was, man, I was, I was taking drugs and all that sort of stuff. And and it, it's quite well documented now about you know, the challenges with addiction that I've had. Um, but I got to a point where my life was so problematic with that stuff that I needed to, to, to clean my life up with that, you know? So whilst the the life on the field was great, the life off the field was okay when things were going well, but when they weren't going well, it was just com like compounded with this this conversation in my head that, you know, you get you go out and, and, and you, you you were around us footy boys a, a fair bit. You know, we used to come over your house for feeds, a fair few of us, you know? Um, and whilst you get treated in the street like you're on a pedestal with some with some parts of the community you know we might take photos or sign autographs or, or things like that where behind the closed doors i hated who i was i hated who i was because everything inside my head just told me i was worthless i want to i want to talk about your book joey and we're, we're we're not here to plug your book but there's a reason why i want to talk about your book and um, when you finished your career, you, you, you wrote your pretty much memoirs of your battle with mental health and um, defining the enemy within was the, the book that you bought out. And I, the reason why I want to talk about it is I, I want to tell you about and tell everyone about my experience with that book because I've known you wrote, you've written a book, you know, we've, we've made some Facebook and, you know, we've known each other a long time. and. Uh, I'd seen that your book had been launched and I was at Brisbane Airport the day after the launch and uh, lo and behold, there's the enemy within. My little mate Joey's book sitting there in the- My bad head. My the, bad head staring Yeah, you're him up, looking at the, uh, staring me in the eye. So as any mate does, you know, I go in, I buy the book. You want to support your mate. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, I, I had no, no interest in reading it because, you know, I don't get me wrong, I love to read. I, I'm more a, 
a John Grisham or a true crime. You know, the self-help section's never really been somewhere that I've gone to. But please, I bought your book and I was on a flight to Adelaide and I was going down to Adelaide, we were doing some work down there, um, labor hire work. And I was going down, I started reading your book and it's a two hour flight from Brisbane to Adelaide. Joey, I got to Adelaide and I was probably 70% through your book. And I got off the plane and I had a little house in Adelaide, which was an hour away from the airport. Um, I walked straight off the plane and I sat in the, the waiting area, the departure down waiting area, because I had to finish the book. Now, your book affected me greatly for, for two reasons. And one reason was I couldn't believe how, how brave you were to, to put your, yourself out there and, and tell everybody your story. But sitting there um, reading your book and reflecting after it, I actually felt like a real prick because you were writing about a time, as you said, you know, we were good mates and, you know, we were close. Um, you, you broke down your marriage, you moved into my house and spent some time with me until you got on your feet. And, mate, you're talking suicide. You're talking deep and darkness. Now, I remember that time when you when you come and live with me, you know, I knew you were doing it tough. You know, I knew, Joe, you were doing it tough. You had a breakdown of your marriage, two beautiful kids that you absolutely lived for, you know, Brody and Phoenix, where you just absolutely lived for them. And I think out of all our crew, you were sort of the only one with kids at the time. Everyone was, you know, everyone was single and having a good time and going to Coogee Bay Hotel. And, you know, I remember how proud you were as a father um, when Brody played footy at Redfern. I must have got about 20 calls from you that week. Make sure you come down on Saturday, hey, Brody's playing. And I think we had the whole South Sydney NRL team down there that day to support Brody in his first game. But, mate, I had no idea what was going through your head. And it rattled me and it got me thinking that if I'm living under the same roof as you and I don't know what's going through your head, I've got no doubt there's farmers out there that have got the same issues right now and their wife, their brother, their business partner, their kids, um, all those generational people that work around them have probably got, probably don't have the same idea. Um, you know, it rattled me, Joe, I'll be honest with you. And I, I couldn't put it down. You know, I guess mental health and especially with, with farmers, they're such a resilient bunch. And I think your story can resonate with a lot of farmers because back when you were playing rugby league and when you, when you were boxing, mental health was, was not really talked about. Um, wasn't talked about at all. Wasn't talked about at all, you know, and if you were, you know, if you had a few little mental problems, you know, the perception was, oh, he's a bit soft, that bloke, you know, he's, he's a bit weak, he's, you know, he's a bit weak. And farmers have that same perception that, you know, if someone's doing a tough, a farmer will, he'll bottle it up inside because he doesn't want to be perceived as being weak, you know. Farmers are tough, they're, they're resilient, they're adversity fighters. And I think, you know, if anything, uh, what advice would you give to to farmers that, that are facing or feeling um, this way? What are the telltale signs and, and yeah, how can a husband or a wife or a brother or son identify them? There's so much in that, Rod. And, and, and the thing is, right, is that whilst whilst I hid, I hid it behind the closed, I, I hid it from the public eye very well, but behind the closed doors, my behaviours didn't show so as, as much, right? So. Yeah, have a look at it. Like I always tell people, there isn't one singular format that can help people uncover what their partner, their husband, their wife, you know, their close friend might be going through. Um, what I what I tell people the most important thing is to just pay attention to our behaviours, right? And 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 anything that's the slightest ways that's different, that could be a trigger. You know, so what we need to do is just just have a look at whether or not our husband or our partner is snappy, right? Now, now coming from a, an extremely tough time with with the drought, and then you know, then straight into floods, and then you know, obviously with the with the downturn that we've got now throughout the world, 
Um, you know, th there's a stack load of people that are impacted by this. Like the, the mental health rates and the, the challenges with our mental health on the back of what's happening throughout the world now, particularly in this country, in the, in the current climate that we're in now, it's going to far outweigh anyone that, that, that the, the numbers, it's going to far outweigh the numbers that we're going to lose by the virus, by the numbers that we're going to use by the people that are impacted by suicide and mental health in our communities, right? So uh, as far as what advices there are, there is no one way to fix it, but I know, I know who, I know the behaviors of my family under my, under my roof. Just like you would know the, the, the behaviors of your family, just like every husband, every wife, every mom, every dad, every, every, every child, every, every son, every daughter would know the impacts of their behaviors with their family. I always say, just look after your circle, right? And if we all look after our circle, then that can broader, you know, start to, to, to reach out to the broader population. But let's just really pay attention to each other's behaviors. And today's Are You OK Day, right? Now, the thing is with people with, with mental health challenges, they will get themselves up today, one day of the year, because 99% of the community is on the lookout for mental health behaviors and challenges today, yeah. today, right? What we need to do is continue this conversation every day. Are you okay days tomorrow and the next day and the next day after that? But it isn't just about asking, are you okay? It's about having a look at behaviors and going, he's just told me he's okay, but I know he's not. Yeah. Right. So what we need to do is just plant the seed. One of the best advices I was ever given is what can I do to make it better? right what can i do to make you feel better and i get that that the climate and the challenges that farmers are under don't particularly you can't particularly make things better you can't go outside and turn on the rain no right you can't you can't you can't yeah. you can't what is a shut and, up we can't just you know, miraculously you can't have plant, labor turn up you can't plant and pick your crops yeah right just by by a blink of an eye but i think it's the attitudes of how we approach things and this is what i look at this is what I look at, um, you know, Aboriginal culture. Everyone thinks that Aboriginal culture is just about dance and just about yeah. artworks and things like that. But Aboriginal culture for thousands and thousands of years was about looking after each other. And how we looked after each other is through telling those stories, right? So all of those stories have elements of behaviors in them. And the behaviors have, the stories have values which are associated to our behaviors. Yeah. Right? So all of those stories for thousands of years for thousands and thousands of stories across this country, all had elements of love, care, respect, humility, compassion, all right? So every single one of my behaviors is directed by one of those values, right? So if we can live more with those values in our lives and start to have a look at implementing those values in our life, and when we have a look at those values in our life, it's about implementing things for other people, right? So it's about showing care for people, it's about having respect for people, having compassion for people. And, and farmers, we know farmers are about, you know what, if there's if there's a fire next door at the property, we go over and help, right? If they need something done, we go over and help, right? So farmers are always about helping each other, but sometimes we can be isolated because we're such big properties of, of what they have. I think you touched on a good point there in isolation, Joey, and uh, in the interest of opening up, you know, I've this year, I've had my fair share of, um, <clears throat> I wouldn't say mental health issues, but levels of anxiety. Um, you know, we've been in the business of providing labour to, to multiple farmers and all of a sudden the backpackers have all gone home and um, I've got more and more farmers ringing me for help. And I'm the sort of guy that, you know, if, if you come to me today, Joey, and said, I need to borrow five grand, if I didn't have it, I'd go get it off my mate and give it to you and get myself in the shit. And that's, that's the sort of bloke I've always been. And in this world of COVID now, what I've found is I used to fly a lot to, to different areas. You know, if I needed to go to Coffs Harbour, I'd jump on a plane, I'd go down to Coffs Harbour, I'd see my growers, I'd fly back. I'm doing a lot of driving now. And when I was on those flights, I'd have my iPad, I'd be watching Seinfeld, or you know, I'd be watching Friends on my iPad or reading a book. Um, while I was on the plane. When I'm on a six hour journey and it's me, the radio and my thoughts. Me and the road.
that's when my anxiety kicks in yeah because that's when my brain starts thinking oh you know i'm going down to see this bloke and he's going to want help and how am i going to help him and i don't want to let him down and you know like if i can't get him the people i'm a failure and you know like i'm going to be the result of this bloke's business getting ruined because i can't get the people to pick his crop and i have all these noises in my head joe on the, on the drive to the point that you know there was times i'd, I'd have to actually stop and also you know like take a deep breath and i think how how i dealt with it was i'd start listening to positive podcasts while i was driving and things that would uplift me but you know you, you look at a farmer in a sim similar situation that is out there on his tractor and he's plowing his ground or he's spraying his crop and there's nothing but his thoughts and time and he's thinking i've got this crop how am i going to pick it how am i going to find the labor you know how am i going to appease the bank how am i going to pay the kids private school fees to send them away how am i going to pay the mortgage how am i going to pay the higher purchase how am i going to walk into town tomorrow and see johnny the mechanic and tell him i ain't got a check for him um how do you control and in your book, you talk a lot about the noises in your head. Um, how do you control those noises? Because I can tell you now, farmers have got voices in their head going off like crazy at the moment. Well, the thing is as well, is that everything everything in, in, in modern time is, is dependent on time, right? So we look at everything needs to be on at a certain time. Everything needs to be off at a certain time. We need to have everything done by a certain time. And if we don't do that, then that's when the impact of the challenges happen, right? Um, what I what I can advise is that we can only do what we can only do, right? So if, if we know that we're doing the absolute best that we can, there's nothing that we can do. And the, the challenge with with mental health challenges, particularly around around depression, right, is that and, and anxiety is, is that we think absolutely no one else in the world would understand what we're going through. Hundred mm, percent. But here's the thing, right, is that the whole entire world is going through this right now. So absolutely everyone knows exactly what we're going through, but that doesn't convince our head that, mm. right? So what we need to do is just continually just stay present, stay right now. The more we look too far forward, so you're going, when we're looking too far forward for an example is, how am I gonna do this for this person? And what am I gonna do if that doesn't happen? And then, and then if that doesn't happen, then I'm gonna be bankrupt. And if that can, like, that's all projecting forward, right? So the problem with thinking too far 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 in the, in the future is that it creates thoughts and patterns around anxiety. So we're Correct. thinking too much of the future. About the past is about depression, right? I didn't do this, I didn't do this. If I hadn't have done that, or if I did do that, then I wouldn't be in this position that I'm in now, right? Everything to, to do with the past. You I, I, I question people all the time. Tell me what your anxiety is about. Well, it's about if this happens, if that happens, what am I gonna do when that happens? The challenge, the thing is, we don't know if tomorrow is gonna happen. Hmm. Correct. Right. And don't get anxiety over that by any means. But what I'm saying <laughs> is that you go back to 2019, none of us would have predicted that we're in the position we're in now. No, 100%. And so everything can change in a heartbeat, right? All we can do is stay present right now. The past is gone. There's nothing we can do about it except learn from it. And the future, well, the future may not may, not even happen. Like I tell the future is just a made up word to give us anxiety. Mm. Well, all we can do is worry about now, right? So if we're doing the best we can, if we're if we're doing the best we can with what we've got, right? Doing the best with what we, the best way we can with what we've got and how we know how, then that's all we can do. And the and the fact that everyone is in the current that everyone is in the current climate and everyone is in the same situations, then all I would advise to those people is just have a bit more compassion because everyone's going through it. Absolutely, everyone's going through these challenging times. We just have to do our best to get out of these tough times the best way we can. Yeah, Joey, I, I, I agree with you 100%. And, um, you know, what, what advice would you give to, and we'll, we'll run a little bit of a, I guess, a case study here that, you know, you, you're a farmer and you make Johnny farms next door and, you know, he usually comes over and has a beer with you at the end of the day and you talk about the day and you notice he's a, he's a little bit off, but he's a closed book and you can relate to that because you were a very closed book about your problems. Um, how do you strike up that conversation in trying to get him to to open up to you? Like, what are the, 
the things that you can do to to get him to open up or to to even have that you know one thing that scares me is you, you don't want to have a hard conversation with a mate that's got mental health you could probably tip him over the edge so yeah if, if you've got someone that's got a problem what would your advice be in, in your experience on, on how to address it there's actually loads of research around the opposite mate mm. is that the, the the conversations are the things that we need to have right so it's not a matter of tipping us off the edge when we're when we're feeling like that it's that when we don't talk about it that's when things bubble up so yeah. when we start to talk about it it starts to take things off the top and and and, and relax that, that those current stresses at the time um what i would suggest and again farmers terminology i'm not a farmer by any chance but just keep planting the seed yeah but all you, all you got to do and all you can do is just keep telling them not 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 um you've got to come and talk to me mm. right like like I, I wouldn't encourage people to say come and talk to me when things aren't well i would encourage people to say what can i do when things aren't right right so so everything when we're going through it as a person who struggles with 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 chronic depression is that we think we are the problem right and that no one else would understand so if we if we if we plant a seed with them and say what can i do to help that's taking the onus off what you're thinking about in your own head and put it on someone else mm. right and then someone else then can take the weight off your shoulders so it's about it's about always just checking in always yeah. checking in and always having the conversations and plant the seed with things like man i know you're not well mm. i can tell i can tell in your behaviors i can tell in your voice i can tell where you're snapping i can tell about the stories and the way you're talking about things. I know things aren't right, mate. And it's okay if you don't want to tell me, but know that I will listen the minute you want me to. Yeah, and I think that's important. Like I, I did a field day, an act field day, uh, a couple of months ago. And um, next to my, we had a booth, I can play at a booth that meet growers. And next to, to our booth, there was a mental health booth, which was for farmers. And these guys next to me had some brilliant paraphernalia, um, brilliant information about mental health issues and problems and how to deal with it. But in the two days of the um, the ag um, exhibition, mate, not one farmer was going to walk up there in front of his mates and say, "Hey, can I have some information about mental health?" And I think I think that's what the problem is: is no one wants to go and say, "Hey, you know, Joey, you did it. You turned around and said." I got a problem. I got a problem, and I've, it took you to the stage of, you know, and I know it's not something you like to talk about, but you, you attempted suicide, you attempted to take your own life. Um, it it took that for you to realize, hey, I've got a problem and how to address it. But I think, Rod, the, the biggest thing as well, and this is the biggest takeaway, is that when I started to talk about it, just when I very first went public with things, the amount of people that came up to me and said, you know what? I know exactly what you're talking about because I go through it as well. And I can guarantee you there will be farmers out there, people from the same industry in the same environmental challenges that we're having, going through the same challenges personally, mentally and emotionally. I guarantee you there will be some people out there that are going through the same thing. Oh, a million percent. I've got so no it's doubt. about having that, it's about sparking that conversation first and you know what if you're one of those people that can just be vulnerable but like there's there's something about men and something about stoic men that we don't want to be vulnerable like someone will think that we're weak million you know percent, what Joe. i played million footy percent. in the toughest competition in the world i boxed and got me, me head punched in most nights all right i used to go all right mate i, 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 I watched you win right. a few i watched you win a few i'm talking about <laughs> the spa, in the spa and in the spa i used to get me head punched in i used to win when it counted um, <laughs> But mate, there's something, like the thing is, is that what we're hiding is just emotions. Like no one is void of emotions. Every single person in the world has emotions. And the fact that we're not emotionally intelligent to be able to talk about these things are the reasons why we're having troubles. Joey, do you we, ever look back on your career and the battles that you faced and, you know, what'd you play, 50, 60 first grade games? Play 50. 50, okay. A person of your ability and skill probably should have played a couple of hundred because, you know, I watched you single-handedly win games with just pure skill. And, you know, you were, you were 75 kilos ringing wet and you had 120 kilo blokes running at you, which, you know, you were brave, you were, you were skillful. 
do you ever look back and think, I only wish that I had someone that I could have talked to and addressed these problems earlier, rather than suffering for the five or six or seven years that you did? Without a doubt, mate. You know what? Without a doubt, um, it, it would have been it would have been great to be able to. And the thing was, again, it was a challenge of the times, wasn't it? You know, like yeah, no, one spoke well, about no, one, no one knew about mental health. Back no one then. spoke no one about did. it then, right? Yeah. So, it, in, in the current climate now, someone's not going to look at you like you got four heads. No, right? Because it's it's a it's a the conversation's louder than it ever has been. Right. So, did I wish that I could have spoke to about it with someone? I wish I had the tools to be able to cope with it. Hmm. Right. And the thing is, it didn't. It wasn't until I went into boxing did I learn how to take those. To, did I learn how to develop those tools? And that tools, funnily enough, was about getting punched in the mouth. Yeah. Because I, I, I wasn't a real tough guy physically. But you had this job. So, you had but I had to up. You but had I had to up. be. Yeah. I had to be because I was a small bloke, and then when you're in the boxing ring, there's nowhere to hide in there. No. Right. So. Um, the thing and you is, get a tough in boxing too. You know, I've, I've still got a photo. And you know, you'll probably remember this photo when we did the fight night out in Griffith, and you you had to get down to I don't know what weight you had to get down to, but you were I was little skin <laughs> and bone, yeah. and you got on the scales and you dead set looked like an anorexic greyhound. Um, you know, you put your body through <laughs> hell, and then I took you straight up to my mate Gino's restaurant, and uh, you had a big plate of pasta as soon as you as soon as you had the weigh in. But I think. You know, back in those days, you know, mental health, you're right, it wasn't spoken about. But I think now, if you actually admit it, you get more respect for it. Oh, because, mate. because there's you're, strength in vulnerability. There's strength in vulnerability. A hundred percent. Because if you if you start to share your vulnerability, it gives other people strength as well. Right? So now the conversation isn't about being weak, to put the conversation is being about how strong and brave that person is to do that. Right? But I also get that it's one of the most challenging things to do. It. I, I reckon I 100%. If, we could, if we could break down the barriers, and I guarantee you that, you know, when we talk about those two farmers that are neighbours that have a beer together at the end of the day, I guarantee you, and I don't want to stake my reputation on it, that if one of them decided to drop his guard and say, mate, God, I'm doing it tough, you know, I guarantee you the other bloke would turn around and say, fair thinking, mate, me too. And all, of a sudden, and all of a sudden, a weight would be lifted and, mate, that would turn around and down a six pack and, and spend a couple of hours talking about their troubles and getting that off your chest because, you know, that that stress in your chest, getting that off your chest, that's a huge thing, isn't it, Joe? Not only that, Rod, is that, and again, we talk about how I wrote a book. Writing a book was probably one of the most therapeutic things I've ever done. Hmm. Right, think about it. When we go and sit in the counselor's chair, all we're doing is talking about the issues that we got. I sat and wrote it down. It might have took me sixty thousand words to do it, but in saying that, I, I, well, I was getting out of what was it going on inside my head and writing it down onto paper. And whilst some sentences didn't even make sense, but the mess in my head wasn't making sense either. Right, so that's why I encourage people all the time to write things down. It just it gets it out of your head, it puts it down on paper, and then put it away for a week, and then come back to it. And then you think it about it and go, holy hell, like what was going on with me that day? <laughs> but it's just about getting the madness out of your head and putting it down on paper to pull it away. Because once you see it, then it, it looks to you and you go, well, well, that's actually not true. Like I can actually, I can actually come up with tips and tools to be able to get through that just by talking to my wife about it, just by borrowing some tools from the bloke next door, just by getting a hand of some other people who know that I'm in the exact same situation, who, who then I can give them a hand when they need. And I think one thing, you know, a lot of people don't understand about mental health is you can have the best support system around you, the best family, the strongest family. That don't mean crap, all right, with what's going on in your head because I look at you, Joey, and I look at, you know, your career, the people you had around you, the great Artie Beetson, the great Johnny Lewis, your father, Wilfred, an absolute champion of a man. Um, you had all the tools around you, but not um, to be successful and to, you know, to turn to talk to people, but 
none of them, and you're talking about superstar people, could control what was going on in your head. You know, Johnny was super upset when he read my book. I heard, he wasn't he, I, I heard he bawled his eyes out. He wasn't upset about what ha what was written in the book. He was upset that he didn't see the signs. Hmm. And that's how I right. felt. Like I told you, I felt like an absolute prick. Because and I'm like, how I didn't know this? Like, shit, you're writing about a time at the breakup of your marriage and you're living in my house. And I didn't even see it. I remember you used to stay in your room and listen to music and play the guitar and you just wanted to be by yourself. I, I just thought, well, shit, Joe wants to be by himself. He's gone from seeing his two beautiful kids every day to looking at me. Any wonder he wants to be by himself. I'll just they're let the conversation. They're the, they're the times. And again, now, like you look back at that, you had no idea at the time. No, and but I right now, if that happened tomorrow, you've got the tools to go, hang on, Joe, let's go out for, for a walk or let's go and get a coffee or let's go and get a food. But you know what my what my situation was? Well, shit, he's doing it tough. He's, his marriage is busted up. I'll just let him be. Where I should have actually been asking, Hey, Joe, are you okay? Yeah. yeah. Like, I just left, I, I left you in the room. And when I read your book, I actually felt really guilty of, how did I not see it? You know, I, 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 I gave you a place to stay and I thought, shit, that's enough. You know, I've given him a place to stay. He wants to be alone. Fair enough. I left you in there. Mate, you were suicidal. The and thing I had is, no Robert, idea. Yeah, the thing is, mate, is that, and again, like, I guess hindsight's a beautiful thing. It is. But now, but now... And again, that was that was a long time ago. Yeah, you know, that was that was back in uh, what are we, 2010 or something yeah. like that? That's you know, 10, 11 years ago, um, mate. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, but mm. now these these conversations are louder than ever because yeah. it's impacting our friends. You know, when we talk about the rates of depression and anxiety, we're talking about one in three people, right? Oh, and, especially mate, now in the middle of the pandemic, it's probably in the one middle of two. the pandemic on the back of a drought. You know, yeah. like. Like, uh, it's just one of those things where now let's not let's not leave any stone unturned. Mm. Like, let's not take the chance and say, "Oh, he'll he'll be all right." Oh, he looks fine. He he said he was okay, so he looks fine. Like, let's let's continually just keep trying to pl you know plant the seed, keep reaching out, uh, putting our hand out for you know to to help people and things like that. That's where that's where we can make the difference, mate. I think one of the important things you touched on, Joe, is looking at the tell signs. And last week, I had a call from a mate of mine that uh, he rang me up and he's like, Rod, where are you? I said, I'm at the office. He goes, I've just had a conversation with a mutual mate. He said, I've just had a conversation with him and he's just blown off the handle because he's under the pump. He said, he's absolutely given it to me. You know, call me every name under the sun. And he was really upset by it. And I said, mate, don't worry, don't stress. I'll, I'll give him a buzz and I'll pull him in the line and I'll pull his head in. And my, my first mate said, no, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to pop over his farm and see him because I'm worried about his mental health. I'm not worried about the fact that he called me every name under the sun. I'm actually worried about what's triggered that. And, you know, I thought that was really great. And I, I did, I got in the car, I went over and I said, mate, you're right. And he said, oh, I'm under that pump, you know, like, price of strawberries is in this shit and I can't get workers and yada 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 and you know like but isn't it great that someone can say I'm worried about his mental health go check on him rather than be worried about the fact that he just he saw the tell sign and that's exactly what what you're saying look at the behavior we'll make judgment yeah right? the first thing we do is make judgment mm. in that situation I always say to people don't look at what look at why don't look at what happened look at why it happened right with behaviors and again behavior is language Let's look at what language they're speaking. When they're not turning up to things, when they're not returning calls, you know, when they're flying off the hand like you. I know that that all sorts of anger, all sorts of, you know, disagreement around around different things and projecting stuff on, on you know, projecting our behaviors onto other people is just a sign for something else. You know, we never know what's going on. That's why I always say we just need to be kind. We just need to be kind and compassionate because we don't know what's going on behind the closed foot doors for somebody. You know, Joey, for people that are fighting, you know, these issues, you know, you, I think you're diagnosed as having bipolar. Um, you've got memory loss, you know, uh, from the hits in the head and getting punched in the head. <laughs> and, you know, um, I'll probably ring you tomorrow and say, and, and you know, I'll, I'd make light of this, but it's actually serious. I'll probably ring you tomorrow and say, Geez, that was a good yarn yesterday, Rod. And you're likely to say, did we have a yarn yesterday? What, what are we uh, that's talking That's how serious about? it was with you, Joe, at the time. Yeah. 
mate, it's been like that for a long time. You know, things are starting to slowly rewire and, and the brain, the brain's an amazing thing that we, whilst we know so much about it, we only know what, you know, the size of a pinhead of, of what the actual brain's capability is. And, um, you know, the memory, the memory's been impacted for, for many years now. And mate, there's days where I, have, where I forget to pick up my kids from school. Well, that doesn't go well with the ex when you when you're trying to when you're trying to you know trying to get your kids as it is and then they're trying, you know they're flying off the hand like you because you're forgetting to pick them up from school. Um, maybe but again, like I, I, there were there were times where you know someone someone rang me year, it was years ago in Wagga and I was doing a, a big charity event in Wagga and they rang me and I used to work at a school right so they, the school finished at three o'clock and they said it was ten to three when they rang me and then. I said, look, I'm going to be home. I'll finish school at three. I'll be home by quarter past three um, and we'll work something out. And she said, what we'll do is well, I'll meet you down at your gym at 3.30 for some media stuff. Because there's a big there's a big event coming up, a big fundraiser event that I was involved with. Right? I get home, school finished at, that, that phone call finished. I get home, school finished at three o'clock. By the time I got home at 10 past three, I'd completely forgotten about the conversation completely forgotten about the media stuff that we had to do and I had to sleep. So I woke up to 25 missed calls and people just couldn't couldn't um, get the fact that my memory would just wipe, the short-term memory would just yeah. wipe. Um, and you see it with so many boxes and um, maybe we, we talk about it being a little bit punchy, being a little bit punch drunk, you know, like, um, and add on to the top that I was only a little fella playing footy um, against some, you know, big blokes like Petro, Sivan Siva and those sort of guys flying at me a thousand miles an hour. Um, it's like a it's like a truck hitting a mini miner, mate. Um, yeah. oh, me not me not being the truck. Yeah, <laughs> Joey, I, I guess you know, for a farmer watching this and a farmer that's going through, you know, some mental health mental health battles, mental health issues, bordering on depression, stress, anxiety. Um, does it get any easier, mate? Without a doubt, I I was I was awarded the Australian Mental Health Prize in two thousand and nineteen. And I, and I remember, I don't remember a great deal from the speech that I wrote that night, but it was, it was republished uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald as an opinion piece um, because I ripped into Scott Morrison a little bit. I and remember was, that, yeah. He was, sitting, he was sitting in front of me. He was about 15 metres in front of me. When yeah, I they were off you that day, weren't they? About different things. Um, <laughs> but, mate, one thing, I, one thing I do remember writing about it is that in 2012, I genuinely believed that my life couldn't improve. I believed that my life wasn't worth living anymore. And I know... You know, many years down the track, having travelled around the world, um, now an author to you know not only my own autobiography but but contributed to many other books. Um, someone who continuously works at what I do with my head, and and when we're talking about mental health, it's just our brain health. Our brain's the most powerful organ in all of our body. It's the one that we neglect the most. I said in that speech, with time, awareness, and persistence things can and do get better, right? We just have to continuously look at how we can improve what we need to do to be the best version of ourselves. Yeah, and I think that's important, Joey. And I think, you know... You it know, does get better, mate. It, it honestly does. In the in the tough times, you may feel, and you're, this that's the thing about depression, it, it robs you of reality. As I've said, it tricks you into believing that nothing's going to improve. It tricks you into believing that you're a burden to everyone. It tricks you into believing that your life is is, is better off not here anymore. Well, I'll, I'll tell you something now, and I think the last time I saw you was 2013 at my wedding, believe it or not. Mm. Um, and, you know, I've seen you at your fittest. I've seen you at your strongest. But I think today, I've truly seen you at your happiest. And, oh. uh, you know, I guess you are testament of it doesn't matter how fit you are, how, you know, how muscly you are or how fit you are. If you ain't, if you ain't fit here, um, nothing else matters. Well, I think, Rod, let's have a look at it. And again, like, I played in the first South Sydney team to reach the semi-finals. The semi-finals, in yeah, you took it to the semi-finals. Or like people, for, people forget that. You know, I, I played in that and, and, and played a significant role into, get, into getting us into that position. Um, so, so my life has been, I, I, I boxed and won titles. I won the WBF world title twice, you know? So looking at, at where my life was from a sporting perspective, yeah, I've reached some highs, but from, from a mental health perspective, I've reached some, the lowest of lows. 
But again, sitting here and, and, and I can honestly agree with you when you said that I, you know, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the happiest I've ever been. I'm the happiest I've ever been. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm. That's not because I'm playing in the NRL or I'm boxing or I'm. I've got thousands of dollars in my bank. So it's, it's quite the opposite. I'll, I'll I've tell got you, everything I need, mate. I've got I'll tell you why you're the happiest you've ever been, Joe. Is and I and I've known you a long time. And one of the one of the biggest things you can ask anyone about Joe Williams, I'll say he's one of the most proudest Indigenous men that you've ever come across. You're a man that's extremely proud of your heritage. And you're out there now spreading the word of mental health to not just the indigenous community, but the broader community. But community, you do a lot of you do a lot of charity work with young kids. I, I remember, you know, when I was living in Griffith and I started training a couple of Koori kids, and um, I was training in boxing. And I, I couldn't get I couldn't get into their heads because I didn't understand their culture. And all of a sudden, I, I rang you and I'm like, Joey, I said, you know, what, what do I do? Let me talk to him. And yeah, you know, I still remember that day. I had those kids, and they're like, "Yeah, unk, yeah, unk, yeah, unk." And you, <laughs> you reached them, and their whole attitude changed. And you're the sort of bloke that's a giver. And I reckon the reason you're so happy now is you, you found your calling. Um, you've been given a second chance, and you're hell bent on not wasting it. But geez, it must feel good going out and trying to help people, mate. As I said back in 2012, I come to the conclusion that I'm extremely lucky to be standing in front of you. You know, if I had it my way back then, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. Right? Something bigger and greater than me kept me here. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it is. I won't push my belief system onto anyone out there. I have my belief in what it was. But the most important thing is that I'm here. Right? And I realized with that second chance, I've got to be about helping other people. And the more I started to look at, again, the value system that I that I live with now and and, and and looking at the values around love, care, respect, humility, and compassion, it's all about giving. Those, those, those values are about giving. The more we give, the more we receive. You know, so so we just need to continuously share good things in our lives and and and, and do the best we can uh, as people to improve other people's lives. You know, we we're caught in a society where we need to improve our lives. The minute we shift our mindset to improving someone else's life, the minute it starts to come back to us. The more we give, the more we receive. I think in the middle of this pandemic, Joey, what, what I've seen with, you know, farmers obviously, you know, farmers rely on backpackers to come in and harvest their crops, okay? And backpackers, borders are shut, backpackers all left, and there's no one out there. I think one of the biggest issues with mental health is farmers, they can't go blaming themselves for that, but they tend to. They mm. tend to say, oh, I can't get workers, I must be a shit farmer, or I mustn't be paying the right rates, or, you know, I, I mustn't be good at what I do because I can't attract people. Mate, you can't attract people because of the pandemic, Mate, and you've got to accept that. Again, that's not that's not a reflection of them. That's a that's a reflection of this this dirty, conniving, filthy disease that we call depression. Like that's Yeah, 100%. It's, it's, it's that's, cunning, that's it's tricky, it's baffling to the point that it it, it it literally robs us of all type of reality. You now reality is in, we know there's nothing we can do. We can't change the borders to be closed. No. We can't go outside and make it rain. No. Some can, I can't, no. but it, it's, it's one of those things that the times that we're in now, you know what, I'm a big believer in the, the, the path of life. For thousands and thousands of years, my people have walked on this land, right? every single day in those thousands of years have led us to exactly where we are today right where we're going tomorrow it's going to happen for us whether we like it or we don't mm, correct right? so we're going to we again looking back in 2019 2018 when the drought was on and then we started to get some rain people thought things were going fantastic but then we hit with the pandemic we don't know what's next no all right we just need to make do and and do the best we can with the best that we've got every single day and be the best version of ourselves in that. And more importantly, I reckon we've just got to be a mate and, you know, look at what you've identified here today, look for the tell signs and be in a position because as a, as a bloke and as a blokey bloke that farmers are, you're going to open up to your mate more than you're going to open up to your wife, you know, because you, you're too proud to, to go and tell your wife, hey, I'm, I'm worried about this or I'm worried about that. The wife's raising the kids, the wife's looking after the household. You don't want to put that out of pressure on you. So 
But yeah. also, let's not forget, right? That, again, that's what the head tells us. Let's not forget that wife is the one who loves us more than anyone loves us. Oh, a million percent. A million percent. Right? I'm just... So that wife will have our backs no matter what hmm. when we start to be vulnerable and open up about our tough times that we're going through. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a great point, Joey. And I think, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is the generalization and there lies the problem. Um, yeah. every, everybody needs to... Generalization isn't reality, brother. No, no. That's what yeah. we need to look at. We need to look, we need to stop listening to our heads and start looking at reality. Yeah, no, you're spot on. Look, Joey, I won't take up too much of your time. I, I want to say congratulations on the steps that you've taken post-career. You are an inspiration. Um, your book's still out there in bookstores. How, how can someone get a copy of your book? Because if, if, someone, if someone doesn't want to go and open up about the problems um, that they're facing, go and get a copy of Joey's book, only because it's been written by a battler, okay, from Wagga, in layman's terms, and I guarantee you, you can resonate. Uh, Joey, where can they get your book? The thing is, mate, um, and again, like it's it's written for the people. Uh, like a lot of people who have read it, they said it's like you're talking to us, Joe. Hundred you know, percent. That's no how big, I felt. Actually, there's no big jargon. It's not a long book because I couldn't. Have written, I couldn't. I, I can't understand the long words myself. So, um, <laughs> mate, I, I wrote it from front to back. That's the thing with me. It's authentic because I wrote it, um, mate. All of our all of our books are through our website, um, pretty much now. Um, you know, when, when um, you know, new books come out, uh, bookstores tend to go for the new books. Go for the, the old new books. So what's, what's so, your website, Joe? Mate, my, have a look at my website. It's just www.joewilliams.com.au. I had to keep it nice and simple again because I'm a bit punchy. Um, <laughs> and and uh, mate, through my Instagram and Twitter pages, uh, at Joe Williams uh, underscore T-E-W. Um, so www.joewilliams.com.au. Um, and then the other socials as well. And I know you do a lot of um, corporate speaking, talking about your story. Uh, is that still on the table? If someone wants to, you know, there's a lot of grower associations that have grower nights. And, you know, I think that someone like yourself going out, talking your, telling your story, at, they've, they've always got guest speakers. Um, how does any of those associations get, get in touch with you if they want to get you out there and uh, have a yarn to a few growers? Yeah, the same sort of thing, mate. Just through the through the through website, website, all that sort of stuff, um, mate. We're we're always doing different events. Um, it's a, it looks a little bit different now. Obviously, we're doing things virtually and so forth. But you know, with a bit of luck, uh, before the end of the year, if not early next year, things will start to open up again um, around the around the country, and we can be back out on the road. But you know, prior to the the pandemic, I was on the road 300 plus days in the year, um, which was about different communities and helping out and doing different events, uh, just helping people go through the tough times. I'm gonna finish by asking you one question. Um, I'm a farmer, I'm doing it tough. I'm sitting on my tractor, I'm there spraying a crop that I've got no idea whether or not I'm gonna pick and my mind's racing. What do you say to me? Brother, pick up the phone, you know, we've. We've, we've all got, we've all got, um, you know, uh, internet and so forth. And, you know, our, our phones are, uh, I'm assuming most, most uh, farmers are on, on the networks with their phones and stuff, pick up the phone and ring Lifeline, um, you know, those type of things. So, and with that, it's an anonymous call as well. So there's no, there's no judgment with that, but um, mate, talk to people, talk to people, write it down, um, get it out of your head. You know, how we get it out of our head a lot of the time is through things like being just being present. Remember I talked about being either in the, the, the future or the past? Yeah. You can't do anything about the past, only learn from it. And tomorrow might not even come, so we just have to live now. Live now, be mindful in the present moment, look for gratitude, look for exercise, and mate, pick up the phone and ring places like Lifeline on, on 131114. You know, it's, it's one of those things where you know, these, these crisis hotlines do a fantastic job in their 24 hour access um, that, um, you know, that, 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 that are always open to, to people. But I, I guarantee you one thing, the minute you start to, to, to reach out and start to get help with this stuff, the minute, I hon honestly promise you this, the minute you start to reach out and get help for this sort of stuff and show some vulnerability, the minute things start to get well. And I think your testament to that, Joe, you've been, you know, in your career, you've reached the absolute highs, 
you've been to absolute lows and here you are 15 years later. You're the father of how many kids you got now, Joey? Three, four, I can't keep up, five. What, oh, what do you got? You might give, if you're a stump bull, you mate, under the bus right, all that. you've got... Uh, I've got five, mate, five. Five, five, yeah. Um, all done now, but the, uh, the the gloves are hung up, the boots are hung up, the scissors are out. I'm, I'm, I'm no more left in me. <laughs> well, mate, um, all I can say is you've got five beautiful kids, and thank God that you're here after what you've been through to be able to walk a couple of daughters down the aisle and take a couple of uh, sons on Bucks nights and uh, enjoy your kids growing up and, uh, you know, being here to be a grandfather one day. Uh, something that 10 to 15 years ago probably wasn't a possibility. So it does get better. I'm just thankful that, that I'm here today. They're gonna to have conversations and I've got friendships around the world that, that I'm gonna tune into and have these conversations, mate. What, 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 whatever's next, we don't know. I just know that I'm gonna be the best version of me today. Well, a testament to you, Joey, is, you know, like I said, 2013, I got married, you're at my wedding. We're in 2021 and yesterday I rang you up and I said, Joey, I said, I wanna, talk about mental health with farmers and you dropped everything and said, let's do it. And that's the sort of bloke you are when it comes to, to this cause in particular, that's very close to your heart. Um, you're a strong advocator. And I think a lot of people can, can resonate with you because you're not, you know, a doctor that's going to give a thousand statistics. You're just going to talk real life experiences. And uh, mate, I want to thank you for having a yarn on the farm and talking about this very important issue with us. And, uh, all I can say is, guys, here's a man that's been through what a lot of you are going through right now. He's come out the other side. Um, he's happy to tell his story. Uh, it's a great story. It's, it's, an, it's an inspirational story. But more importantly, if I could take anything out of this having a yarn on the farm with Joe today is look for the tell signs. Have a look at your mate, have a look at your neighbor. Make sure he's okay. Have a yarn with him, you know. Make sure everything's all right. Joey, thanks for having a yarn on the farm and uh, thanks for everything you do with mental health, mate. And uh, we wish you all the best. Always a pleasure, brother. Good to connect and big love to everyone out there listening. Good on you, Joey.